Good morning, book lovers. My name is Alex, and you're watching Mental Jumping Jacks. Thank you so much for being here. If this is your first time here, welcome. We are so happy to have you. If you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for your continued commitment. We're so grateful for you. Today, we're going to continue the second half of the book haul that was abruptly uh, interrupted yesterday. My battery died on my phone and it just suddenly stopped. And I refused to start the video over again because I had already gone through a decent amount of books. And so I really do not wish to re-record it. So today we're just going to do the second half. Uh, I'll link below the first half of the video, first half of the haul, excuse me, uh, if you're interested in seeing those books as well. And today, just like every other book haul that I do on this channel, we are going to read, and by we I mean I am going to read the full summary for each book. So it is a, a really long video. I like to take my time with the summaries. Sometimes I like to read some excerpts and some comment, make some commentary as to why or where I purchased these books. So please feel free to serve yourself your favorite comfort food, your favorite beverage. It's going to be a very relaxing, laid back, entertaining video. If you love the company of books as much as I do, then you have come to the right place because there's no better company than the company of books. Um, feel free to put us in the background while you're trying to get some work done, while you're trying to do some chores around your home. If you'd like to watch the video in full and take a seat with us, then that's even better. Thank you so much for being here for that. We love book lovers here since we are incredibly passionate about books ourselves. And by we, I'm referring to me, myself and I and my two pups whom at some point you will end up seeing or hearing. So I apologize in advance for that. If you like this content, please make sure to like and subscribe. It helps the channel's algorithm. If you'd like to receive notifications as to when new content comes out on the channel, please make sure to hit the notification bell. And let's get right into it. The first book in the pile is The Tender Bar, a memoir by J.R. Moringer. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, oh, is this one of those books that has the, an introduction instead of a summary on the back? It does. It has an introduction. Let's see what it says. I'll read some of it. I, I don't usually read the full introductions. <laughs> it's my puppy already complaining, trying to get comfy. There's a prologue. I'll read a couple of paragraphs from, from the prologue. So just a little background information. This is a movie that Ben Affleck made either on Prime or Netflix. I can't remember. I watched it a couple of years ago. I thought the movie was okay. I didn't love the movie. I thought it was, it was decent. Um, but so I'm hoping that the book is way, way better. Typically the book is much better, though I do uh, have some books that I, I actually prefer to the movie adaptation than the books themselves. And I'll eventually do a, a video on that. But for today, let's read a the couple of first paragraphs for, for this book so you can see whether it makes sense for you to add this to your TBR list. And if you'd like to check out that um, movie on Netflix, I think it is Netflix, then feel free to do so if you're a Ben Affleck fan. Okay, it says, we went three for everything we needed. We went there, sorry, we went there for everything we needed. We went there when thirsty, of course, and when hungry, and we went dead tired. We went there when happy to celebrate and when sad to sulk. We went there after weddings and funerals for something to settle our nerves and always for a shot of courage just before. We went there when we didn't know what we needed, hoping someone might tell us. We went there when looking for love or sex or trouble or for someone who had gone missing because sooner or later everyone turned up there. Most of all, we went there when we needed to be found. My personal list of needs was long. An only child, abandoned by my father, I needed a family, a home, and men, especially men. I needed men as mentors, heroes, role models, and a kind of masculine counterweight to my mother, grandmother, aunt, and five female cousins with whom I lived. My goodness, poor kid. <laughs> the bar provided me with all the men I needed and one or two men who were the, the last thing I needed. Long before it legally served me, the bar saved me. It restored my faith when I was a boy, tended me as a teenager, and when I was a young man, the bar embraced me. While I fear that we're down, drawn to what abandons us and to what seems most likely to abandon us, in the end, I believe, we're defined by what embraces us. Oh, I like that. Naturally, I embraced the bar right back until one night the bar turned me away, and in that final abandonment, the bar saved my life. 
there had always been a bar on that corner by one name or another since the beginning of time or the end of prohibition, which were the same thing in my hard drinking hometown, Manhasset, Long Island. That is so cool. I, I already know for a fact that I'm going to enjoy this book. I was riveted really by his story in the movie and the fact that he is very vocal about how smart he is and how it's been a struggle throughout his lifetime for people to, to be able to relate to people and to be able to communicate well with people. I think he's a, he was tested genius, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so that becomes, so he, he lacks emotional, what he has in, in intellect, he lacks in emotional intelligence and the bar ends up helping, helping, what? helping him to learn that, to learn those skills. So I know this book is going to be really interesting. It, it, it already seems very gripping, which I'm really interested in reading. Okay, moving up, uh, moving up. What is going on with me? I can't speak. The, you know what it is? It's too early and I haven't had a single sip of tea just yet. So my caffeine um, withdrawals are starting to kick in. Mm. Oh my goodness, that is so good. Okay, that is exactly what I needed. Next in the list, we have The Life of John F. Kennedy Jr., America's Reluctant Prince by Stephen M. Gillen. And the summary says, I, sh I should clarify, I have read so many books about John F. Kennedy Jr., the JFK, the, the father. I've read several books about him, um, really, really good books, actually, that I'll, I'll probably recommend in the description box if anyone is interested. But I've never read a book about JFK Jr. This will be my very first one. I have another one somewhere in my storage unit, which for whatever reason I haven't read just yet, but I'll probably read it at some point this year, depending on how much I enjoy this one. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see all of his political ambitions and the bright future that he had ahead of him and how it all came crumbling down. I'm sure most of you already know, so this is not a spoiler. He ended up uh, passing away in a fluke um, airplane accident, which he was piloting at the time. So let's see what the summary says. It says... In 1981, Stephen M. Gillen was a graduate student and teaching assistant at Brown University assigned to give a lecture on the presidency of John F. Kennedy. He, con he covered some of JFK's triumphs, but discussed his failures in even more detail. And who was in the front row? John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr. It was an inauspicious meeting, certainly, yet it somehow birthed a lifelong friendship. After Brown, Stephen Gillen became a noted scholar, historian, and biographer at Yale, Oxford, and the University of Oklahoma. But he wasn't ready to write about his friend or share the stories and secrets only he and John's inner circle knew until now. Through the lens of their decades-long friendship, Gillen examines John's life and legacy from before his birth to the day he died, covering the highs, the lows, and the surprising incidents, perspectives, and relationships that John never discussed publicly. Gillen shares his own memories and recounts stories from many of John's confidants, several of whom have never spoken on the record before. Using his skills as a researcher and historian, Gillen also dug up previously classified Secret Service documents and long-closed FBI files revealing never-known details about both John Jr. and his mother Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. Together, the personal and historical facts create an unforgettable portrait of a man who had huge ambitions and a bigger heart always trying his hardest to be, to be just John, as normal a guy as he could get away with, given his heavy inheritance and his lifelong reluctance to bear the many bird, burdens and expectations the nature, nation placed on his shoulders. Using his incredibly unique perspective as both a scholar and a friend, Gillen accomplishes something no other biographer could, the full spectrum account of John's complicated and rich life. Gillen proves that the story of John F. Kennedy Jr. is far more than another tragedy. Rather, it's the true key to understanding both the Kennedy legacy and how America's first family continues to shape the world we live in today. <clears throat> and there's a 
um, a brief excerpt in the back that says, it wasn't easy being John. Yes, he was fabulously wealthy, strikingly handsome, and the beneficiary, beneficiary of his family's extensive connections. But the John I knew, the one I discovered in researching this book, was also complex. He often struggled with the burden of expectations opposed upon, imposed upon him. John once told me that he was actually two people. He played the role of John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr., the son of a charismatic president who had inspired the nation. He understood what he represented to millions of people, and he was willing to assume that burden. But he never confused that public role with his private identity. He spent his life trying to develop an authentic self separate from that of his famous father and well-known family. He often wore a mask in public, never revealing the inner doubts that haunted him his entire life or showing the range of emotions that he shared with only a handful of close friends. Ooh, this book, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a, it sounds delightful, but it also sounds slightly haunting. So I'm really looking forward to reading this. I'm going to pack these up while we speak because I have to place these in storage. I don't have any more bookshelf space left in my home. So I keep having to go to my storage unit to pick out my next reads for the month, for the incoming month. Um, okay, so next up we have My Greatest Untold Missions and the Art of Being a Sniper, Way of the Reaper by Nicholas Irving with Gary Brozek. I like to read a lot of military books, military strategy, veterans books, memoirs, you name it. A lot of political content, current events, all of that. So here's what the summary says. A rare and powerful book on the art of being a sniper. Way of the Reaper is a thrilling chronicle of how a sniper works, told through the lens of some of Irving's most significant kills, none of which have been told before. Each mission is an in-depth look at a new element of eliminating the enemy from patience to focus, timing to weaponry. This compelling narrative is also a heart-pounding true story of some of the Reaper's boldest missions, including the longest shot of his career of over half a mile on a human target. In Iraq and Afghanistan, Nick Irving earned his nickname in blood, destroying the enemy with his sniper rifle and in deadly firefights behind a .50 caliber machine gun. He engaged a Taliban suicide bomber during a vicious firefight, used nearly silent subsonic ammo, and was the target of snipers himself. Way of the Reaper places the reader in the heart of battle, experiencing the same dangers, horrors, and acts of courage Irving faced throughout his career and as an elite member of the 3rd Ranger Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment, while also examining the personal ramifications of taking another life. Readers will experience the rush of the hunt and the dangers that all snipers must face while learning what it took for Nick to become an elite manhunter. Like the Reaper himself, this explosive book blazes new territory and takes no prisoners. Ooh. This looks so incredibly interesting. It, it, I know it's going to be an absolutely riveting book. Um, it, I don't know if you want to see a picture of uh, Nicholas Irving, but he is so intimidating and slightly hypnotic. <laughs> he really is very, very good looking. Okay, I may have to put this up here to read a lot sooner than what I thought. Uh, next up in the pile, we have, I got, I can't believe I did this. And the only reason why I did was because I picked it up at a Dollar Tree. Uh, I've said this before in my videos, sometimes the Dollar Tree will sell books and believe it or not, they're very good, very high quality books. They're, they're, um, excess inventory from either Barnes and Noble or sometimes Target, um, I'm not sure if they have from Walmart, but I know for sure they have excess inventory from Barnes and Noble and Target. And so I saw this book in the pile and I thought, well, I'm not a, at all a Bill O'Reilly fan, but I do have friends that swear by his books. He's a little too much of an alarmist for my taste and he loves salacious content and he loves to sensationalize, sensationalize everything. Um, he's very, he's, he's got a very bombastic personality and he loves to create um just very aggressive spellbinding type of narratives and he has a tendency to 
um, hyperbolize some things. And I guess it just makes the content more exhilarating, more exciting, uh, which is fine. I'm okay with it. As long as he stays true to, to history, I'm okay with it. We'll see how I feel about this will be my first Bill O'Reilly book. Um, in at, in at least 20 plus years, I read one of, I read half of one of his books, I think in 2001 or 2002, which I didn't really care for, but maybe he surprises me. Maybe he's improved since he is a staunch American nationalist. Nothing wrong with that. Good for him. So he has a tendency to have a very Americanized lens in writing his books so we'll see how it goes. It's called The Day the World Went Nuclear, Dropping the Atom Bomb and the End of the World War II in the Pacific by Bill O'Reilly. And here's the cover again, in case you're interested. And the summary says, Autumn 1944, World War II is nearly over in Europe, but in the Pacific, American soldiers have faced an enemy who will not surrender, despite a massive and mounting death toll. Meanwhile, in Los Animal Los Alamos, New Mexico, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer and his team of scientists are preparing to test the deadliest weapon known to mankind. Newly inaugurated President Harry Truman faces the most important political decision in history, whether to use the weapon. Adapted from Bill O'Reilly's historical thriller, Killing the Rising Sun, and with his characteristically gripping storytelling, this book explores the decision to use the atom bomb and the end of World War II in the Pacific. So I guess this is an adaptation, not that I guess it says it, clearly says it, it's an adaptation from a previous book he wrote, The Killing, Killing the Rising Sun. Um, and I know now exactly why I purchased this book. Oppenheimer, when I, when I saw this at Dollar Tree, Oppenheimer the movie had just come out and I was on the fence as to whether or not I wanted to watch it. By the way, spoiler alert, I still haven't watched it. Maybe I'll watch it this weekend. So I picked up the book because I should have known that it wasn't a typical Bill O'Reilly book. It looks like um, very quick excerpts from his previous book, which I'm okay with. I really, I'm not going to read his, his previous book. I, I don't have that kind of patience for Bill O'Reilly, but it does have a plenty of images and very, very large font. And so it'll be a very fast read. Maybe I'll read this before I watch Oppenheimer just to help me along and get it and um, get familiarized with the subject matter before I, I watch the movie. You know what? I will do that. I'll, I'll read this one night this week before I watch the movie this weekend. Next up in the pile, we have changing gears, really changing gears. Hold on, my friends. I need a little sip. Oh, that is so good. I'm waiting for an email to come in, but I don't know what's going on. Okay, uh, let's see. Next up we have Fast Feast Repeat. Jen, oh, sorry, from the New York bestselling author um, from Fast Feast and Repeat, Jen, Jen Stevens, Jen. What a great name, Jen. This is cleanish. Eat mostly, mostly clean, live mainly clean, and unlock your body's natural ability to self-clean. And the summary says, in Jen Stevens' New York Times bestseller, Fast Feast Repeat, she showed you how to fast completely clean as part of an intermittent fasting lifestyle. Now, whether you're an intermittent faster or not, Jen shows you how to become a cleanish, how to become clean-ish where it counts. You'll learn how to shift your choices so you're not burdening your body with a bucket of chemicals, additives, and obesogens it wasn't designed to handle. Instead of aiming for perfection, which is impossible, or changing everything at once, which is hard and rarely leads to lasting results, you'll cut through the confusion, lose the fear, and embrace the freedom that comes from becoming clean-ish. As you learn how to lower your toxic load through small changes, smart swaps, and simple solutions, you'll evolve simply and naturally toward a cleanish lifestyle that works for your body and your life. I really needed this, friends, because we are almost at the end of uh, March and I still haven't lost the holiday excess weight. I really indulged over the holiday season and I gained about 10 pounds and I seriously need to lose them ASAP. Actually, no, I probably gained about 15 pounds. That is a lot of honesty, friends. 
I think this tea hasn't kicked in yet. I am talking way too much. Mm. Oversharing, TMI. Okay, moving on to the next book in the pile. Let's just put this in the storage box really quickly. Next up in the pile, we have Someday is Not a Day in the Week, 10 Hacks to Make the Rest of Your Life the Best of Your Life by Sam Horn. A bright yellow book that caught my attention. I loved that it had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday crossed out. I am a notorious procrastinator. And then I get into these crazy, um, energetic, determined, uh, determined um, just bouts of energy and bouts of productivity. And then I get everything done in one hit. But I wish I, I could learn how to span out a little more of the things that I need to get done instead of leaving everything for the absolute last minute and then rushing through it. I don't know if I get a kick or, or, or um, if I find the, the thrill of the deadline more exhilarating or I don't know what it is. But anyway, I really wish I could stop doing that. Hence the reason why I picked up this book. <laughs> Do you wish things were different but don't know where to begin? Do you promise yourself you'll change and then never go, go get around to it? Do you wish you had clarity on what to do with the rest of your life? Are you planning to do more of what makes you happy when you have more time, money, freedom, or courage? What if that never happens? As Paolo Coelho says, one day we'll we, we sorry, one day you will wake up and there won't be any more time left to do the things you've always wanted to do. Oh, I hate bright books. It kills my, I can't see it well. Excuse me. Sam Horn is a woman on a mission about not waiting for someday. And this is her manifesto. Her dad's dream was to visit all the national parks when he retired. He worked six to seven days a week for decades. A week into his long delayed dream, he had a stroke. Sam doesn't want to that to happen to you. She doesn't want that to happen to anyone. She took her business on the road for a year by the water. During her travels, she asked people, are you happy with your life, work, relationships, health, legacy? If so, why? If not, why not? The surprising insights about what makes people happy or unhappy, what they're doing about it or not, and why will inspire you to create time for what truly matters now, not later. Life is much too precious to postpone. The good news is there are little changes you can make right now to be happier, healthier, and more fulfilled. And you don't have to abandon your responsibilities, quit work, or win the lottery to do them. You'll love the, you'll love the inspiring quotes, helpful exercises, and real-life success stories of people just like you who stopped waiting and procrastinating and started creating a life they enjoy and are proud of. Oh, my goodness. I forgot how much I loved this book when I originally read the summary. Let's see who Sam Horn is, shall we? Founder, CEO of the Intrigue Agency, is a communication strategist and international consultant. She has spoken to more than half a million people worldwide and to hundreds of organizations, including National Geographic, Cisco, Fortune 500 Forum, Intel, Na Nationwide, YPO, Capital One, Boeing, and NASA. She has been interviewed on dozens of network TV and radio shows, NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, and on NPR and MSNBC, and has been profiled, quoted, or published in publications including the New York Times, Forbes, Forbes Inc., Fast Company, HuffPost, and Reader's Digest. Horn is the author of Tongue, Who, Pop, and the Washington Post bestseller, Got Your Attention? Question. Hmm. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen today? Am I going to end up putting all of these books in the immediately to be read pile? I've already got an insane number of books lined up for April and I'm not re reading as quickly as I have in the past. This year, I'm really going slowly because one of my absolute non-negotiable New Year's resolutions was to enjoy what I am reading. Last year was a catastrophic year. I really hardly enjoyed anything that I read last year, but I still met my uh, minimum of 52 book uh, books for the year goal. And I think I was way more focused on the goal than I was on the, um, the nature of the books I was reading, the, the subjects. And so I really didn't enjoy the books. This year, I'm doing it backwards. This year, I'm going much slower, but I'm truly enjoying what I'm reading. And if I'm not, I'm no longer scared to DNF a book 
which means did not finish for those of you who are just getting into the whole um, book lover kind of uh, mindset. Anyway, next in the pile is Capitalism in America, a History by Alan Greenspan and Adrian Woolridge. And the summary says, from the start of, this, of his fabled career, Alan Greenspan has been famous for his deep understanding of even the most arcane corners of the American economy and his restless curiosity to know even more. To the extent possible, he has made a science of understanding how the US economy works how the US economy works almost as a living organism. He has made a particular study of the question of productivity growth at the heart of which is the riddle of innovation. Where does innovation come from and why does it spread more equally in some societies than in others? In Capitalism in America, Greenspan and the celebrated historian and economist, journalist Adrian Woolridge, distill decades of grappling with these questions into a thrilling and profound master reckoning with the decisive drivers of the U.S. economy over the course of the country's history. They unfold a tale of vast landscapes, titanic figures, and triumph, triumphant breakthroughs, as well as terrible moral failings. Every crucial debate is here, from the role of slavery in the antebellum Southern economy to the real impact of FDR's New Deal to America's mood swings and its openness to global trade. But above all, to read capitalism, capitalism in America is to be deeply stirred by the millions of ordinary Americans who have driven this country to extraordinary power and prosperity. At heart, the authors argue America's genius has been its unique tolerance for the effects of creative destruction, the ceaseless churn of the old giving way to new people and ideas. Often messy and painful creative destruction has also lifted American standards of living to unprecedented heights. Justice and human decency demand protection from the pain of change, but the United States has always accept, accepted more pain for more gain, and its vaunted rise and the challenges faced depend on the legacy, on this legacy. In the current moment, stalling productivity growth has stirred up populist furies. There's no better time to apply the lessons of history to the most pressing question we face that of whether the United States will, will preserve its prominence or see its global leadership preeminence, sorry, preeminence, or see its global leadership pass to other less democratic powers. I am looking for it. Sorry, the sun has decided to leave us, friends. I, I was struggling so hard to read the summary. But, um, I'm looking forward to reading this book. I'm a little reluctant, if I'm completely honest. I'm nervous about what this book has to say. I have a very serious love-hate relationship with Alan Greenspan, depending on what's happening in the economy on, on any given day. Um, so here is the book, again, if you're interested in reading it. I will do a summary on it at some point, at, uh, some, some day this year, hopefully. Can't really say that I may read it this year. I may read it next year. Who knows? But anyway, saw it in the bookstore and I had to pick it up. Next up, we have Napoleon, A Life by Andrew Roberts. Friends, this book is absolutely massive. <laughs> it is, how many pages is this book? This book is... You know what? Let's not let's not uh, include the bibliography. This book is <sighs> my goodness, eight hundred and ten pages. <laughs> eight hundred and ten pages, not including the notes. And I like to read a lot of the notes because I like to do my own research on some things. Uh, look how beautiful this book is, the illustrations. It has a lot of illustrations, which I love because it gives a lot of um, context to the, the prose. Oh, I'm so excited. Josephine, his wife, and Napoleon himself. His mother as well. <gasps> This is going to be an enthralling book. I can already tell. Let's see what the summary says. It says, and I apologies if I 
misspeak because I can hardly see anything. It's about to pour here. It says the French Revolution was spiraling out of control when Napoleon Bonaparte became a general at 24. The American Revolution gave us Washington, but the French got in Napoleon a man who was Washington, Jefferson, and Madison rolled into one. He was a brilliant military strategist. A visionary workaholic fascinated by every detail in the running of his empire, Napoleon wrote a new legal code, transformed the French educational system, created the Louvre and the Bank of France, introduced the metric system, and rebuilt Paris. But was but was the cost of his ambition too high in lives and liberties? Together with Josephine, whose infidelities he surprisingly forgave, he put his stamp on an era and brought France triumphantly into the modern age. Here at last is a biography worthy of its subject, magisterial, dynamic, and a pleasure to read. I've never read anything by um, Andrew Roberts before. He's also, also the author of Churchill. I just remembered, I, I own that book. It's in storage somewhere. I haven't read it yet because it's also a serious tome. It's colossal. It's, it, it's enormous. <laughs> and it's a little intimidating. I know this will take me a good month to get through only because I have a really bad habit of reading more than one book at the same time. But I will get to it at some point this year. I'm really looking forward to it. Next up in the pile, we have The Years That Most Matter, How College Makes Our or Breaks Us by Paul Tuff, author of How Children Succeed. Uh, I picked up this book when I saw it because it was on sale, but because I also have a kiddo just about to graduate from college. And I don't know, I, I felt like I really needed to get a, a different perspective we were debating whether or not um, a master's degree directly, go, whether going into a master's degree straight out of her bachelor's made sense. And so I wanted a, a different perspective. We kept oscillating between ideas and timelines and whatnot. And is there a right answer? I don't know. Does it depend on the kiddo? Probably. It probably depends on the kiddo. So let's see what the summary says. It says, does college still work? And the system designed just to protect the privileged and leave everyone else behind? Oh, sorry. Is the system designed to just to protect the privileged and leave everyone else behind? Or can a college education today provide real opportunity to young Americans seeking to improve their station in life? The Years That Matter Most tells the stories of students trying to find their way with hope, joy, and frustration through the application process and into college. My goodness, Delilah. Okay, are you all right? Drawing on new research, the book reveals how the landscape of higher education has shifted in recent decades and exposes the hidden truths of how the system works and whom it works for. And it introduces us to the people who really make higher education go. Admissions directors trying to balance the class and balance the budget, college board officials scrambling to defend the SAT in the face of mounting evidence that it favors the wealthy, researchers working to unlock the mysteries of the college student brain, and educators trying to transform potential dropouts into successful graduates. With insight, humor, and passion, Paul Tuff takes readers on a journey from Ivy League seminar rooms to community college welding shops, from giant public fla flagship universities to tiny experimental storefront colleges. Whether you are facing your own decision about college or simply care about the American promise of social mobility, the years that matter most will change the way you think, not just about higher education, but about the nation itself. I'm so curious to know how you feel about higher education, friends. Did your bachelor's degree make sense? Did your master's degree make sense? Was the expense and time and effort worth it? I have my own feelings about it, especially after I finished my master's, but I'm so curious to know your feedback on it, to, to hear your uh, opinions. If you'd like to leave a comment in the comment section, that would be fantastic. Um, if, you're, if you end up watching this video all the way through, uh, I'll ask you to put a graduation cap emoji in the comment section, and I'd be eternally grateful to you for watching this video all the way through. But I'm really curious to hear from you as to whether you feel that your degrees made any difference in your professional um, life lives. I, I'm sorry, I'm still waiting for the caffeine to kick in. Anyway, 
Next up in the pile, we have SPQR by Mary Beard. And it says, ancient Rome matters. We will judge ourselves against its history of empire, conquest, and excess, and its debates about citizenship, terrorism, and the rights of the individual influence how we think about civil liberty today. Covering a thousand years of Roman history, SPQR reveals in the vivid detail how Rome grew from an insignificant village in central Italy to the first global superpower, as well as casting fresh light on Roman culture from running water to democracy and from slavery to migration. Mary Beard shows us how the Romans thought about themselves and their achievements. SPQR is the Romans' own abbreviation for their state, Senatus Populus K. Romanus, the Senate and People of Rome. And this magnificent book is an eloquent and a definitive account of their story. I picked this up because while I was on vacation, um, I kept seeing a bunch of TikToks and Instagram posts about um, from different women asking the men in their lives how often they thought about Rome on a daily basis. <laughs> I didn't really understand the concept or the thought process behind it. So I saw this book while I was on vacation. I couldn't access the other book that I had brought with me on the trip, um, that I brought with me on the trip. And so I picked this up at a little local bookstore and I haven't started, actually I did start reading it, um, but I just caught up, got caught up in the whole vacation, vacation mode my goodness, I can't speak. And I really didn't read much more beyond that. So I may put this over here as well. My gosh, my, my TBR list is, has, is just out of control. I did a nonfiction book haul specifically for women a couple of days ago. And I also added some books to my April TBR list, which I hope to be able to get through right at the moment. I'm at like 10, 11 books for April not going to happen obviously so i'll have to get a little bit more selective once i actually decide what i'm going to read for the month um and then i'll leave the other ones for may but next up in the pile we have um in search of a kingdom francis drake elizabeth first and the perilous birth of the british empire by lawrence burgreen <clears throat> excuse me and the summary says Secretly dispatched by Queen Elizabeth to circumvent the, circumnavigate the globe and later called upon to save England from the Spanish Armada, Francis Drake was a hot-tempered, red-haired rogue who made his reputation by plundering and pillaging his way to the ends of the earth. Drake is regarded as a folk hero throughout Great Britain, a combination of unparalleled explorer and Robin Hood, but he was also a former slave trader and the brash hustler who beguiled the nearly insolvent young queen of England. For Elizabeth, he made the impossible real. In 1580, Drake became the first captain to circumnavigate the globe successfully. Ferdinand Magellan, M Magellan had died in his attempt. Almost a decade later, when Elizabeth called upon Drake again, he dramatically defeated the Spanish Armada, spurring the British Empire's ascent. Throughout his career, he reaped benefits by making himself into the instrument of Elizabeth's imperial ambitions. And as the devil-may-care vice admiral of the English fleet, he personified England's transition into Great Britain. The relationship between Drake and Elizabeth is the missing link in our understanding of the rise of the British Empire, and its importance has not been fully described or appreciated. Framed around Drake's key voyages as a window into this crucial moment in British history, In Search of a Kingdom is a rousing adventure narrative entwining epic historical themes with intimate passions. With intimate passions? Hmm. Wasn't expecting that little Easter egg. With intimate passions. I wonder what the author is suggesting. This is Francis Drake. And this book also sounds, ah, it sounds so fetching. I don't know what to do. There are so many books that I want to read right this moment. Ah. What do I do, friends? Do I put this one in the TBR pile as well? I kind of feel like I have to read it. All right. Up next, we have 
decades of decadence, how our spoiled elites blew Americans' inheritance of liberty, liberty, security, and prosperity by Marco Rubio. Let's take another sip, friends. All right, let's see what the summary says. It says, stop doing that. Okay, while many Americans have worried about China, open borders, opioids, failing communities and families in crisis, our elites have told us that, that have told us that's all fine because it's not only inevitable, it's for the best. In decades of decadence, Marco Rubio exposes the elite's attacks on the four key elements of American strength, good local jobs, stable families, geographical communities, and a sovereign nation that serves as a beacon of freedom and prosperity. These have been eroded not only by globalization, but by the lies we tell ourselves, including anyone who loves each other is a family. Real community can be found on the internet. And we're all citizens of the world. It's not too late to reject these errors. America remains a powerful and wealthy nation built on timeless truths ingrained in the very creation of mankind, but we cannot afford another misguided and decadent decade. In this book, Marco Rubio, Rubio shows how we can avoid another dark age and restore America's place as the global ideal of harmony, opportunity, and democracy. I, I'm not a huge Marco Rubio fan, but I really did like the synopsis when I saw this at the bookstore and it had a $5 off um, offer at Barnes and Noble. And I thought, sure, why not? I love to read different perspectives, even if I don't agree with the author, even if I'm not a supporter of that particular political figure or that particular public figure. Um, I still like to read these books. I like to be able to understand how other people view the world, how they, how they view our politics, how they view the future of our country. Um, and like I said, even if I don't agree with them, but I still need to know different perspectives. And let me read really quickly the excerpt on the back of the book. It says, clearly we face a lot of challenges, but despite them all, I am optimistic about America's future. There is no other nation in the world where I, the son of an immigrant bartender and a stay at home mom would be in this position. And I'll be damned if I am going to stand by while our nation becomes just a footnote in world history. Because the truth is that if America fails, I have nowhere left to go. Fortunately, the process of looking back on history has given me reason for hope. It is not too late to correct course and sail away from the siren song of American Marxism. But time is running out. America has been through tough times before, and we have always come out stronger on the other side. This time threatens to be different. Never before have we faced enemies as dedicated to our collapse as we do right at this moment. It is not just a rising China or a belligerent Russia. Radical woke Marxists are trying to destroy us from the inside. They are aided, abetted, and encouraged by our enemies who know internal strife is the fastest way to ruin. We must recommit ourselves to America's founding ideals, have pride in our great nation, and be willing to throw aside the stale policy ideas of the past that to make this a new American country. Interesting. All right. I'm looking forward to that. So next up we have, he saw that it was good, regaining your creative life to repair a broken world by show Baraka. It says, let's reimagine. What does it mean to live out our creative lives in the community and the workplace? We spend most of our days in these places, but rarely do we take the time to examine and assess what we're creating in a hurting world. God has told us in the Bible what he considers to be good. Micah 6, 8 instructs us to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And Luke 10, 27 calls us to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Together, these verses call us to both inward devotion and outward duty, but we must choose to live our stories in light of them. Join Show Baraka in a deep exploration of the intersection of faith, creativity, and justice. No matter your calling, you are using your gifts to build a kingdom, but you must ask yourself, whose kingdom am I building? And when I'm done, will God see that it is good? 
Oh my goodness. I love this. I love this. I love this. I forgot I had picked this up. I think I got this right after Christmas um, at my church and uh, totally forgot I had picked it up. I put it in the pile so that I could do a book haul. And uh, I'm so glad I got to read the summary again. I'm so looking forward to this. Sorry, but this is going to have to go on the immediate reads in my TBR list. Okay, next up we have, friends, we are almost done. I can't believe it. We are almost done. We only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 books left. 12, sorry, 12 books left. Okay, we are getting through these a lot quicker than what I thought, which is really, really good news. Next up, we have An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back by Elizabeth Rosenthal. And the summary says, in these troubled times, perhaps no institution has unraveled more quickly and completely than American medicine. In only a few decades, the medical system has been overrun by organizations seeking to exploit for profit the trust that vulnerable and sick Americans place in their health care. Our politicians have proven themselves either unwilling or unable to rein in increasingly outrageous costs faced by patients and market-based solutions seem only to funnel larger and larger sums of, mo of our money into the hands of corporations in possibly high insurance premiums and inexplicably, inexplicably large bills have become facts of life. Fatalism has set in. Very rapidly, Americans have been made to accept paying more for less. How did things get so bad so fast? Breaking down the monolithic business into the individual industries, the hospitals, doctors, insurance companies, and drug manufacturers that together constitute our health system, Rosenthal exposes the recent evolution of American medicine as never before. How did healthcare, the caring endeavor, become healthcare, the highly profitable industry? Hospital systems, which are managed by business executives, behave like predatory lenders, hounding patients and seizing their homes. Research charities are in bed with big pharmaceutical companies, which surreptitiously profit from the donations made by working people. Patients receive bills in code from entrepreneurial doctors they never even saw. The system is in tatters, but we can fight back. Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal doesn't just explain the symptoms, she diagnoses and treats the disease itself. In clear and practical terms, she spells out exactly how to decode medical doublespeak, avoid the pitfalls of the pharmaceuticals racket, and get the care you and your family deserve. She takes you inside the doctor-patient relationship and to hospital C-suites explaining step-by-step -step the workings of a system badly lacking transparency. This is about what we can do as individuals, individual patients, both to navigate the maze that is American healthcare and also to demand far-reaching reform. An American sickness is the frontline defense against a healthcare system that no longer has our well being at heart. Oh my. I could not put this book down when I saw it at the bookstore. I started reading it there while sitting on the floor waiting uh, for my daughter, but um, I, it, this is an absolute must, especially uh, in a post uh, C era. C being that uh, dirty word that we're not allowed to say on YouTube, the pandemic word. But um, we're getting through these, we're almost done. Next up we have Longitude, the true story of a lone genius who solved the greatest scientific problem of his time by Dava Sobel. It says, during the great ages of exploration, the longitude problem was the gravest of scientific challenges, lacking the ability to determine their longitude sa sailors were literally lost at sea as soon as they lost sight of land. Ships ran around, aground on rocky shores. Those traveling well-known routes or routes were easy prey to pirates. In 1714, England's parliament offered a huge reward to anyone whose method of measuring longitude, longitude could be proven successful. The scientific establishment from Galileo to Sir Isaac Newton had mapped the heavens 
in its certainty of a celestial answer. In stark contrast, one man, John Harrison, dared to imagine a mechanical solution, a clock that would keep precise time at sea, something no clock had been able to do on land. And the race was on. Ooh, I, I love reading about this level of genius. I, I really wish I could say I was even remotely close to this level of intelligence, but it, it, it's mind blowing how these people come up with these different metric systems and how they come up with all of this scientific knowledge by way of trial and error and research and experimentation. And I wish I had that mental wherewithal. I, I, it, it's itty bitty. It's the tiniest book ever. This will be read in one sitting. Um, how many pages is this? The font is rather small, but it's fine. It's only 175 pages. That is one trip to the beach. Okay, next up we have the desire map a guide to creating goals with soul knowing how you want to feel is the most potent clarity you can have generating those feelings is the most powerful thing you can do with your life by danielle laporte it says in the back how do you want to feel this is one of those self-help books that i picked up at the beginning of the year I, these self-help type journals or books for me are really a hit and miss. Sometimes I do exceptionally well with them and I highlight and annotate the heck out of them. And other times I will be two chapters in and I will become so irritated with the author's tone or the trite, um, just undertone of duh. Like this is, these are things that you should already know. And most of these health self-help books really do have that kind of simplicity to them where these are all things that you already know that you should already know they're just being put in writing as a reminder of what you need to get done in your life and so this is what the summary says you want it aspiring hoping reaching so you make a plan to get it the bucket list to-do lists objectives goals except that you're not chasing the goal. You're chasing a feeling you hope reaching the goal will give you. We have the procedures of achievement upside down. We go after the stuff we want to have and accomplish outside of ourselves. And we hope and pray that we'll feel great when we get there. It's backwards and it's burning us out. What if first we got clear on how we actually wanted to feel in our lives and then we set our intentions? What if your core desired feelings consciously informed how you plan your day, your year, your life. You know what will happen with that kind of inner clarity and outer action. You'll feel the way you want to feel more often than not. Decisions will be easier to make. You'll know what to say no thank you to and what to say hell yes to. I bet you'll complain less. You'll be more optimistic, more open-hearted. It will be easier for you to return to your center in the midst of a challenge, I promise. You will do much less proving and way more living, and you will have more to give to the world. For starters, welcome to the desire map. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to get it done. Let's see if I actually get all the way through it and whether or not I can put the lessons into an action plan for the year. We're already in, at the end of March, so, well, who knows? It's never too late to start. Next up in the pile, and we are almost done, friends. We are so close. This is another self-help. I don't know. Is, is this considered a self-help? We'll, we'll see. Five simple steps to balance your ho hormones and restore your joy. Hangry, the best-selling author of Everyday Paleo by Sarah Fragoso and Brooke Kal Kalanick, NDMS. Sarah Fragoso, the best-selling author of, and creator of Everyday Paleo, and Dr. Brooke Kalanick, a leading expert in functional medicine and women's health, bring you the ultimate guide to feeling your best. Oh, I should have put this as part of my um, nonfiction books for women. Oh, what a pity. Anyway, here we go. Uh, and women's health bring you the ultimate guide to feeling your best. Hangry offers women a one of a kind plan that is uniquely customizable to your individual hormonal imbalances with special attention to paid, paid to challenges such as low thyroid, PCOS, pre, uh, perimenopause, menopause, 
and autoimmunity. Not sure if you're hangry? Are you too tired to be happy? Do you feel like metabolism is MIA? Is your plate overflowing with expectations, work, and stress? Hangry honors all of your hormones and each aspect of your life, food, exercise, nutrition, and lifestyle. This program will take you from feeling stressed out and frustrated and feeling freaking tired to happy, healthy, and at home again in your body. Ah, I'm so looking forward to this, my friends. I'm exhausted all the dang time. Okay, next up, we have a really interesting book. I, I, it, I saw it at the bookstore. It's an itty bitty book. Um, it really was uh, attractive when I saw it only because I didn't understand the title. <laughs> I thought it was really, really intriguing um, and something beyond my, my knowledge base, honestly. So the book is called Forest Bathing. A Start Here Guide for Beginners by Dr. Cindy Gilbert, N.D. Forest bathing. Has anybody ever heard about forest bathing? I hadn't until I saw this book. Author and naturopathic physician Dr. Cindy Gilbert introduces readers to the art and science of forest bathing, the deceptively simple Japanese practice of spending time in the forest as a way to find peace and rejuvenation and to promote health. In forest bathing, Dr. Gil Gilbert shares her own personal history with the practice, how in the midst of an urban sprawl, she lost touch with nature only to rediscover it through Japanese practice of Shinrin-yoku or forest bathing. You'll discover in this book, the health benefits of Shinru-yoku from restoring vitamin D to balancing your bio microbiome, the rich mental and emotional rewards that spending time surrounded by trees can offer, how to tap deeply into your five senses, the benefits of practicing forest bathing both individually and in community with family and friends, how to experience true mindfulness in sacred woodland spaces. Most important, forest bathing offers an easy and practical guide to begin your own forest practice and to experience the healing impact of nature wherever you are. <gasps> and I remember why I picked this up. Uh, uh, in November, I had just finished, uh, again, another um, uh, pilgrimage in which I walked through quite a bit of forest and mountains, and I was still on that high of having just finished that pilgrimage. And when I saw this book in the bookstore uh, around Christmas time, I thought, oh, I miss it so much. I really wish I could go back to it. So I, I picked it up on the spot. Next up, we have a book that I picked up purely because I fell in love with the book cover. And then in reading the summary, I realized, oh my gosh, this is so up my alley. This is exactly the kind of crazy, quirky book I love to read. And it's called The Day It Finally Happens, Alien Contact, Dinosaur Parks, Immortal Humans, and Other Impossible or Possible Phenomena by Mike Pearl. The summary says, from a Vice Magazine columnist who, whose beat is the future, here is entertaining speculation featuring both authoritative research and a bit of mischief. A look at how humanity is likely to ride out those epochal days when nuclear war ignites, the global internet goes down, the British monarchy is abolished, dinosaur parks debut, immortality is achieved, and much more. Taking inspiration from his virally popular Vice column, How Scared Should I Be?, Mike Pearl plays out many of the could it really happen scenarios we've all speculated about, assigning a probability rating and exploring how they would unfold. He analyzes nearly two dozen possible events, among them the final failure of antibiotics, the loss of the world's marine life, and even contact with aliens in each instance. And in each instance shows how our new surroundings would look, feel, and even smell. The Day It Finally Happens dispenses a unique form of ex existential therapy as Pearl offers assurances that despite the chaos, chaos that awaits, humanity is likely to pull through. Ah, oh, this is, I know that sounds so strange, but this is the exact kind of book that I constantly read. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I must read that ASAP. Next up, this is the third to last book 
I'm so excited. We're almost done with this book haul, my friends. I can't believe it. We made it through. We made through it. I do that every time. I did that in another video. I don't know why I can't get that saying right. Next up, we've got 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals Oliver by Oliver Berkman or Berkman. Oliver Berkman's New York Times bestseller, 4,000 Weeks, has struck a deep chord with many readers. Nobody needs to be told there isn't enough time, whether we're starting our own business, trying to write a novel during our lunch break, or staring down a pile of deadlines. As we're planning a va vacation, we're obsessed with our lengthening to-do lists, overfilled inboxes, work-life balance, and ceaseless struggle against distraction. We're deluged with advice on becoming more productive and efficient and life hacks to optimize our days. But such techniques often end up making things worse. The sense of anxious hurry grows more intense, and yet the most meaningful parts of life seem to lie just beyond the horizon. Still, we rarely make the connection between our daily struggles with time and the ultimate time management problem, the challenge of how best to use our 4,000 weeks, the average length of a human life. Drawing on the insights of both ancient and contemporary philosophers, psychologists, and spiritual teachers, Oliver Ber Berkman, or Berkman delivers an entertaining, humorous, practical, and ultimately profound guide to time and time management. Rejecting the futile modern obsession with getting everything done, 4,000 Weeks introduces reader readers to tools for constructing a meaningful life by embracing finitude, showing that many of the unhelpful ways we've come to think about time aren't inaccessible, unchanging truths, but choices we've made as individuals and, at, and as a society, and that we can do things differently. Ooh, another self-help book. I was really on a self-help kick at the beginning of the year as part of, oh, sorry, uh, we still have three books left. There's another little one. I will end my video with this book only because it's too funny and very ironic. <laughs> um, next up in the pile, we have Happiness is a Choice You Make, Lessons from a Year Among the Oldest Old by John Leland. I loved the concept of this book, the premise of this book, because um, I used to help. I used to help at a convalescent home. I used to volunteer. Sorry, not help. I used to uh, volunteer at a convalescent home. And I used to love um, sitting down and talking to these octogenarian, octogenarians. And most of them were octogenarians. And they would tell you all about their, their youth, the, the moment that they met their wives or their husbands, the, their, the time that they had their first child, their very, very first important job, what they made at their first jobs, how much they used to pay for the entrance of a movie ticket. And most of them really just want to be heard. So I spent a lot of time having conversations when visiting them. Um, and I highly recommend it to anyone who is having some type of existential crisis or is lacking a sense of purpose or meaning in life spend a good year volunteering at a convalescence home, at a retirement home, or a, um, an assisted living home, and your perspective will significantly change, friends. I'm telling you, it's so worth it. These people have so much to offer us by uh, way of life lessons. Okay, so getting back to the summary, it says, an extraordinary look at what it means to grow old and a heartening guide to well-being. Happiness is a choice you make, weaves together the stories and wisdom of six New Yorkers who number among the oldest old, those 85 and up. In 2015, when the award-winning journalist John Leland set out on behalf of the New York Times to meet members of America's fastest growing age group, he anticipated learning of challenges of loneliness, and of the deterioration of body, mind, and quality of life. But the elders he met took him in an entirely different direction. Despite disparate backgrounds and circumstances, they each lived with a surprising lightness and contentment. The reality Leland encountered upended contemporary notions of aging, revealing the last stages of life as unexpectedly rich and the elderly as incomparably wise incomparably wise. Happiness is a choice you make is an enduring collection of lessons that emphasizes above all the extraordinary influence we wield over 
the quality of our lives with humanity, heart, and wit. Leland has crafted a sophisticated and necessary reflection on how to live better, informed by those who have mastered the art. Ah, uh, I have such a soft spot for the elderly, for animals and for the elderly, um, that for me, this is, this is exactly my kind of book. I know, I, all, I can already tell friends, I will likely shed a few tears. <laughs> oh my goodness, and it has images of the uh, elderly, elderly that he interviewed. Oh my gosh, how cute is that gentleman? How adorable, I can't, I can't. The lessons of John, I'm not sad about anything, but I've had enough, Oh. As a matter of fact, I hope there isn't an afterlife. I can't imagine anything going on forever. I miss, oh my gosh. Okay, sorry, I'm already getting emotional. <laughs> I need to put that here, of course. I feel like I need to um, read that soon. Did I include this book in my previous book haul? <gasps> I'm not sure, honestly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Did I include this in the first half of the book haul? I think I did. You know what? It's okay if we do a repeat book by accident. I'm okay with that. Oh my gosh, I just realized there are two other books here that I completely forgot about. Okay, we're almost done, friends. I, I think I did do this one in the first half. No order. You know what? I'm going to mention it anyway, just in case. Um, it's a really great book, so I want to make sure you guys get a chance to read it. It's called No Ordinary Dog by Will Chesney, a U.S. Navy SEAL with Joe Layden, my partner from the SEAL teams to the Bin Laden raid. And it says, As a young boy in the small town of Lum Lumberton, Texas, Will Chesney had one goal, to become a Navy SEAL. Despite not being an athlete or an outdoorsman, he demonstrated a resilience and a resolve that gave him that that got him through the intense physical training requirement of combat conditioning and survival skills required to become one of America's most elite soldiers as a SEAL team operator. After attending a combat assault dog uh, demonstration, Will's life and career changed forever when he volunteered to become a military working dog handler. Partnered with Cairo, a Belgian Malinois shepherd mix rigorously trained to enter war zones, detect explosives, and attack enemy combatants, Will served two deployments as a handler in Afghanistan. Together, he and Cairo fought the war on terrorism on numerous campaigns and hundreds of missions. In 2011, they were assigned to a secret mission in, in Pakistan known as Operation Neptune Spear, where his SEAL team successfully eliminated Osama bin Laden. More than brothers in arms, Will and Cairo forged a bond in training and on the battlefield that grew even stronger between missions. And when Cairo's active duty status was reduced due to age and injuries sustained under fire, Will maintained their relationship, determined to adopt and care for his best friend when the military retired him. But when Will was severely wounded by a grenade during a mission, it would fall to Cairo to become his caretaker. Only Cairo's companionship, love, and loyalty would remind Will of his self-worth, give him a purpose, and help him to heal. And I got emotional again reading that summary. I get emotional every single time I read that summary. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I wasn't expecting to get emotional again. I thought that got... I had gotten that out of my system the last time. Look at this beautiful, beautiful boy. Oh my goodness, what a handsome, handsome boy. What a good boy. We are so grateful for these puppies' service. Look at him. He's just, he's too precious. I had to pick up this book because I myself also have a half Belgian, half German Shepherd, Belgian Malinois um, German Shepherd mix. My little Delilah, who's taking a nap right next to me, and I thought, oh, I just have to read more about this wonderful, wonderful breed. Um, okay, so next up we have, let's move on, friends, because that book made me horribly emotional. We are now, I promise, this time, this really is the third to last book in the pile. 
And it is, this was given to me back in August and I had put it in um, a pile to do an, a, a book haul uh, unpacking. I still haven't even read the synopsis for this. Um, this was given to me by a friend who has really great taste. So I trust her taste in books. I, I'm, I trust that this will be a really good book. I have no idea what it's about. So let's get into it. Oh, and Philip Pullman referred to it as a profound examination. It's called The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World by Ian McGilchrist. What a strange, not strange, but what a difficult last name. I'm sure I butchered it and I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't see, oh yes, I do, I do. Okay, I thought it was um, just another recommendation. Here's what the summary says. This pioneering account sets out to understand the structure of the human brain, the place where mind meets matter. Until recently, the left hemisphere of our brain has been seen as the rational side, the superior partner to the right. But is this distinction true? Drawing on a vast body of exper experimental research, Ian McGil McGilchrist argues that while our left brain makes for a wonderful servant, it is a very poor master, as he shows it is the right side, which is the more reliable and insightful. Without it, our world would be mechanistic, stripped of depth, color, and value. Ooh, how cool. And it has some images in here because the right side of the brain is the artistic side of the brain, but it's also the most creative and imaginative. Um, and I did read, and I've mentioned this before in a different video, and this is why I have struggled so much with fiction, adult fiction throughout my lifetime. I read, an, I think, a Harvard Review news article or a news article from somewhere years ago that said that highly intelligent people have a tendency to read a lot of science fiction and adult fantasy because they are so capable of creating, of easily creating these um, very... Uh, very descriptive, detailed fantasy worlds in their minds. I struggle with, cre I'm not a very creative person, so I struggle with adult fantasy sometimes. So one of my New Year's resolutions earlier this year was to read more adult fiction, which I've been doing very well with. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I haven't read any adult fiction yet this year, but I've read a ton of middle grade uh, fiction, which I absolutely adore. Um, so I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm going to get around to the adult fiction soon enough. But first, I have to get through some of these books, which I am obsessed with. Anyway, the second to last book in this pile, because we are almost done, my friends, is The Flight, Charles Lindbergh's Daring and Immortal 1927 Transatlantic Crossing by Dan Hampton. I was fascinated. I've always been really intrigued by uh, Lindbergh, especially what happened with his baby. But um, I don't know, it was some, something was so fishy about that whole situation. Let's see what the summary says. On the, raining on the rainy morning of May 20th, 1927, a little known American pilot named Charles A. Lindbergh climbed into his single engine mo monoplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, and, or Lewis, and prepared to take off from a small airfield on Long Island, New York. Despite his inexperience, the 25-year-old Lindbergh had never flown before had never before flown over open water. He was determined to win the 25,000 Ortig prize promised since 1919 to the first pilot to fly nonstop between New York and Paris, a terrifying adventure that had already claimed six men's lives. Ahead of him lay a 3,600-mile solo journey across the vast North Atlantic and into the unknown. His survival rested on his skill, courage, skill, courage, and an unassum unassuming little aircraft with no front window. Only 500 people showed up to see him off. 33 and a half hours later, a crowd of more than 100,000 mobbed the spirit as the audacious young American touched down in Paris, having achieved the seemingly impossible. Overnight, as he navigated by the stars through storms across the featureless ocean, news of his attempt had circled the globe, making him an international celebrity by the time he reached Europe. He returned to the United States, a national hero, fetid with ticker tape parades that drew millions, bestowed every possible award from the Medal of Honor to Times Man of the Year, the first to be so named. 
commemorated on a U.S. postage stamp within months and celebrated as the embodiment of the 20th century and America's place in it. Acclaimed aviation historian Dan Hampton's The Flight the Flight is a long overdue flyer, flyer's eye narrative of Lindbergh's legendary journey, a decorated fighter pilot who flew more than 150 combat missions in a F-16 and made numerous transatlantic crossings. Hampton draws on his unique perspective to bring alive the danger, uncertainty, and heroic accomplishment of Lindbergh's crossing. Hampton's deeply researched telling also incorporates a trove of primary sources, including Lindbergh's own personal diary and writings, as well as family letters and untapped aviation archives that fill out this legendary story as never told before. Huh. Ooh. Oh, wow. The font is very, very large. This is going to be a, a, a quick read, friends. But it does look very very engaging um definitely it, it had a magnetic feel to it when i saw it um at the bookstore and i just had to pick it up so the last book in the pile we are almost done i am so 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 tired and ready to get my day started um the last book in the pile which is very uh, ironic is 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious given the fact that I am trying to get my YouTube channel monetized, Mental Jumping Jacks. Uh, let's see. It says, here are the arguments. Argument one, you are losing your free will. Argument two, quitting social media is the most finely targeted way to resist the insanity of our times. Argument three, social media is making you into an a-hole. Argument four, social media is undermining truth. Ooh, that's interesting. That's why I picked up the book. I remember now. Argument five, social media is making what you say meaningless. Argument six, social media is destroying your capacity for empathy. Argument seven, social media is making you unhappy. <gasps> Maybe because too many people focus on comparisons. Argument eight, social media doesn't want you to have economic dignity. Oh, that's a really, really interesting point. Argument nine, social media is making politics impossible. Argument 10, social media hates your soul. <gasps> it's funny. I, I picked this up because I have noticed that recently I've been... Um, a lot more glued to my TikTok account and a lot more glued to my um, YouTube shorts. I've been going through a lot of shorts recently um, and I need to stop doing that because I noticed that it's taking a toll. It really is taking a toll on my attention span and my patience. I'm finding it more difficult to get into a good uh, reading um, um, pace I'm seeing that uh, it takes me a little bit longer to get to, to to like delve into the narrative than it did before, and I think it's a result of how much time I'm spending on social media on these snippets of information. It also happens to me quite a bit uh, when I spend too much time on Twitter. So I'm obviously not quitting social media anytime too. I think there's also a lot of value in in having social media, so um, I'm not quitting it anytime soon, but I do want to reduce my screen time. So that's the reason why I picked up this book. I hope, I hope you took away some really great recommendations to add to your own TBR lists. I really hope that you enjoyed this video as much as I did. If you did, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that you can know when new, inf uh, new videos come out on Mental Jumping Jacks. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.